please open up your Bible uh, with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. This morning I'll be preaching from verses 1 to 9. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 9. I'll read from verse 1 onwards. The word of God through the Apostle Paul there reads, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. This time I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we're so thankful for this day that you have made. We're thankful for the life that you've blessed us with, for your Holy Spirit that has um, regenerated us, Lord God. Thank you for the new heart that you've given us, for your spirit that lives inside of us. We acknowledge, Lord God, that we still struggle in the flesh, we still struggle with sin. But nevertheless, Lord God, as Christians, we testify that though we still struggle in sin, because of your grace and because of your spirit, We have a strong desire and we have been enabled to live according to the Spirit, to live out a spiritual life. Yes, we are in warfare, but we trust in you, Lord God, and we're so thankful that you cause us to grow, that you enable us to live out this spiritual life, that you have saved us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the very power of sin. Forgive us, Lord God, for our immaturity. I see myself in the scriptures, Lord God. We see ourselves in the scripture. We are not perfectly mature. And we can relate to this rebuke. We're so thankful for the rebukes of your word. We pray that we'd not just be hearers of the word and see these rebukes for others or for the Corinthians, but we would see these rebukes for us, for me. We come to you, Lord God, as uh, needy people. Help us to grow more and more to the image of Christ. We're thankful that we're destined for this purpose, Lord God, but you do ordain the ends and the means, and we just pray, Father God, that we would respond in submission to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before I share what the word of God is saying in these passages, I need to share what the word of God is not saying in verses 1 to 3. Verse 1 to 3 is not saying that a person can be a Christian and be in a position and state of carnality all their lives. These verses are not proving the deception that a person can say a sinner's prayer, be saved and live a life of continual carnality. That is the heresy known as antinomianism and it's an attack on the gospel. Just as legalism in the pure sense of the word is an attack on the gospel, antinomianism in the pure sense of the word is also an attack on the gospel. I say that because the person and work of Christ is mighty to save a person from not only the penalty of sin, but also the power of sin on this side of eternity. And Christ will save us from the very presence of sin when we enter into his presence in eternal life or for eternity. Yes, we still struggle with sin here on this earth, 
But a saved person is no longer under the dominion of sin, as the book of Romans makes, Romans makes very clear. That is, he is no longer a slave to sin. He no longer, he or she, the Christian, no longer lives a life of sin without continual repentance. A true Christian, yes, sins daily, but he repents daily. I say that because true faith and repentance unto salvation leads to a life of faith and repentance, leads to a life of contriteness and brokenness. To say that one can be a Christian but lacks a life of repentance is pure antinomianism. The word antinomianism means anti-law. In other words, someone can be a Christian and not be under the moral law of God. Of course, the moral law of God or keeping the moral law of God doesn't save us, but a person that has been saved has a desire and has been enabled to keep the moral law of God. Tinomianism is an ancient heresy that does not go away. It's popped its ugly head in modern times, and some theologians have identified this as the, quote, doctrine of the carnal Christian. In short, the doctrine of the carnal Christian says that you can say a sinner's prayer, live a carnal life, and still be a Christian. They say that you will still go to heaven, but you will lose rewards. As we're about to see, it's possible for a Christian to behave in a carnal manner, but if he or she is a true Christian, they will eventually repent and keep on repenting. They will eventually and progressively grow. They will persevere to the end. That being said, let's look at what these actual verses are saying. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 3.1. Please keep your eyes on these passages as I go through these verse by verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, the word of God there says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, Paul addresses the Corinthians as he does in chapter 1. He does he also in 3.1. He addresses them as brethren. They were believers by the grace of God. Notice what he says to the believers in 3.1. He says, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Notice with me firstly the word spiritual. The word spiritual can be generally used referring to spiritual things as opposed to like temporal, physical things. The word spiritual is also used throughout the scripture to refer to one's relationship with God. Like the word sanctification, sometimes the word spiritual is a reference to one's positional relationship with God, and sometimes it is a reference to one's practical relationship with God. That is, sometimes it is used to refer to one's spiritual practice. Now, of course, unbelievers are unspiritual in both ways, in their position and also in their practice. They have not been given the Spirit of God, and hence they are not spiritually alive, and they are not spiritual in their position. Because they are spiritually dead. And because they are spiritually dead, they don't live out the spiritual life of a Christian. They don't have no spirituality, they have no practical spiritual deeds. On the other hand, the believer is spiritual because God has given him or her spiritual life and hence they are spiritually alive. That is, they are spiritual in their position. Their position is they are spiritually alive. Now that they are spiritually alive, they have been enabled to live a life of spirituality. A Christian who has been made spiritually alive is now instructed to live out a life of spirituality, a life of spiritual deeds. Notice with me again 1 Corinthians 3 1. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. In chapter 2, he uses the word spiritual referring to believers and the word natural referring to unbelievers. In 3.1, he is saying that they are believers slash spiritually alive, but they are acting immature. They're not acting very spiritual. 
They're acting like newly converted Christians or babes in Christ. Now, just to be clear, there are not three classes of people. There are only two classes of people, believers and unbelievers. However, when God saves a person and makes them believers, they start spiritually growing and spiritually maturing. Now, what Paul is doing is this. He's given the Corinthians a healthy rebuke in such a way whereby spiritual growth is expected of them but was lacking. It's normal for a genuine Christian to behave carnal in the sense of acting immature and acting like a babe in Christ. Just like it's normal for a baby to act like a baby, it's normal for a spiritual baby to act like a spiritual baby and have some bad habits and so forth. But the problem that Paul is addressing is this. They were not young in the faith anymore. He's expecting maturity by now. This is his language. Keep in mind that he was with them for 18 months, and now at the time of his writing, at least another five, even possibly ten years had passed. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, I fed, that's past tense. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. That's what we do to... Newly converted believers. We don't start choking them with all these heavy theologies and so forth. We just give them the truths of the word of God, the truths of the gospel, the truths of who Jesus is and what he has done and so forth. I fed you, past tense, with milk and not with solid food. He's referring to the 18 months where he fed them with the spiritual truths of God. And then notice how he goes on to say, For until now, present tense, you are not able to receive it. And even now, present tense, you are still not able he says this in such, a way, in such a way whereby it is expected that the true Christian eventually mature. For the 18 months, he just gave them basic discipleship stuff. All right, Christ saved you, and now you're starting to mature. Now you start to live a spiritual Christian life, but you're still not living it, is what he's saying. And in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verses 3, he finishes the sentence saying, are you still carnal? Similar to the word spiritual, the word carnal can refer to one's position or behavior. The word simply means flesh. And uh, some modern translations, including the ESV, um, translates it as, as flesh. So carnal, flesh, same sort of thing. The word carnal, flesh, simply means or simply is referring to the sinful nature. Now, of course, an unbeliever is only in the flesh. That is, he or she only has a sinful nature. But a true believer has both. A believer has been made spiritually alive. They have the new nature. They have the divine nature. The believer has been given a new heart and a new nature, but the old nature is still there. There's not three classes of people. There's believer and unbeliever, but the believer has two natures. The believer is at war within himself because the old nature is at war with the new. Not only does the word of God make this clear, it's each and every one of our experiences. This is why we struggle daily. This is why, like Paul described in Romans chapter 7, we have a desire to do good, but there's something else inside of me that wants to do bad. Notice with me in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the word of God there says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, that's the sinful nature, lusts against the new nature, and the, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. When Paul says in verse 3, you are still carnal, the context is clear that he's saying that you are acting fleshly. You are being spiritually immature. He's not referring to their position, but rather to their behavior. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 3. He says, For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like me, men? He's saying to them, aren't you acting in a very fleshly way, the same way that 
unbelievers behave? In other words, he's saying to them, unbelievers have an excuse. They only have a sinful nature. But you have the Spirit of God. It's expected of you because you've been enabled to walk in the Spirit. In verse 3, Paul gets to the heart of the issue that he is confronting in chapters 1 to 3. In chapters 1 to 3, he is dealing with sectarianism. The church at Corinth slipped into cliquishness. The heart behind this party, competitive and rivalry spirit is envy, strife and divisions. <coughs> of course, strife and envy is in all humans. It manifests itself in different ways. But it's in all of our sinful nature. You see it as soon as a baby is born. You see it with children. You see it even when the firstborn um, is just introduced to the secondborn. You see the jealousy on their face. That's the human nature. Strife and envy are described as the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. Envy is the attitude and strife and division are the actions. Envy and strife come from a heart that is not content in God alone. That's why it comes so naturally for the sinful nature and for the unbeliever because they're separated from God. Comes from a self-ambitious heart that is so in love and narcissistic. It's so in love with itself that it cannot bear to see anyone else being blessed. The envious heart cannot bear to see someone else enjoying a good friendship with someone else. And that's why it's so divisive. Envy must throw another person's blessing. Envy won't stop until it destroys healthy relationships because it cannot bear to see someone else happy. It cannot bear to see somebody else have something that it does not possess. You know, when children are envious, they don't know how to hide it. They just blurt it out. You see it in their face, you see it in their demeanor, you see it in their body language, and you hear it in their talk. And they're jealous of their siblings, they're jealous of their cousins, they're just jealous of anything and anyone. When unbelievers are envious, they can get to a state or a place where they become shameless about it and even make a mock of sin. And just sort of laugh it off and just sort of go along with the game. But when a Christian indulges in the fleshly sins of envy, strife, and division, unlike children, Christians, adult Christians, learn to hide it. They either take the sin, they identify it and take it and put it under the blood of Christ, that continual flow that sanctifies us. But if they don't do that, there's only one other thing to do with it. And that is attempt to hide it. Be like a Pharisee, just sort of pretend it's not there, put on a righteous front, but it's there. It hasn't been dealt with. When it's not dealt with in the one and only way by confessing it and repenting of it, is oftentimes hidden under the disguise of spirituality. The fleshly envious Christian can sound so smart and sound so spiritual. So if you think I'm picking on anyone, do you want to know who I'm picking on? I'm picking on myself. Because I too am a human. And I read the word of God and it's like a mirror to me. We all battle the sins of the flesh. It's part of our nature. But there's good news and just hold tight for it. The fleshly envious Christian can sound so smart and spiritual. 
the Corinthians were so wise in their own eyes, they thought they had more wisdom than Paul. They looked down on him as someone who was ignorant and compared him with, you know, people of the world. They judged him according to the standards of the wisdom of the world. And they found him lacking and wanting like a nobody. That's what envy does. It exalts itself, but to achieve that, it must put others down. Fleshly Christians stuck in envy not only puts others down, but sometimes flatters them. It's a nasty web. An envious person commonly gossips and slanders the person they envy, but they also flatter that same person. Sometimes it sounds like it's love. It sounds like they really care about you, but it's flattery. Notice with me what Paul confronts. It sounds like they love him and they're sort of following him and so forth. Notice with me in the next verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, that's flattery. When you say, oh, you're my favorite preacher, you're this, you're that, that's flattery. He didn't relish in the flattery. Woe to the preacher that relishes and enjoys flattery. Because he becomes part of the problem. When he plays the game of the world and just goes on with the flattery. Notice what he says, for when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? In other words, isn't this something fleshly? Isn't this what unbelievers do? Isn't this what, what people with no hope do? People that haven't been enabled by the Spirit of God do? In verse 3, confronts the root, which is envy. And here in verse 4, he co- confronts the fruit, which is idolatry. Paul is saying that it's carnal to idolize preachers. It's carnal to idolize anything. The only person that we glory in is God. In Paul's day, they picked up this worldliness from the theater. Today, it's way more prevalent because of technology. People idolize Preachers they have never even met because it's just on their phone, it's on social media, it's on the internet, it's on this, that and the other. The human nature hasn't changed, but because of technology, it's just easier to access. The truth is that an idolater does not really love the person they are idolizing. That's why Paul's rebuking it. The truth is that a fleshly person is in love with himself and only idolizes and flatters people so that it would serve their own interest. That's what flattery does. It makes flatters someone to get what they want from that person. It's not true love. It's like the multitude who idolized Jesus on Palm Palm Sunday but but a week later wanted him crucified. It's because as soon as Their interests were not met. They turned on him. It's common that immature Christians flatter the preacher one week and slander him the next. The selfish, sinful nature does not love people. It loves itself and only uses people to gratify itself. When a Christian is stuck In jealousy, it wreaks havoc in homes and churches. Oftentimes, churches and homes are split. And people start blaming this all sorts of weird things. Sometimes they blame, oh, we we couldn't agree on whether to buy a piano or the, the music or the Bible version or this version or that version. But oftentimes... It's the immaturity of people. It's the spirit of people. It's strife and envy that causes strife. 
It's the root of it. That's the heart of it. But because envy is hidden, it creates evil and confusion. So people are so confused because it's hidden. The real issue is hidden. And when people are blinded to their own envy, they're oftentimes blinded to the envy of their children. Whenever a parent tells me, oh, no, my, my children are envious of each other. I've heard a parent say that to me. I'm thinking, blind Freddy can see it. Are you serious? That's because they're blinded to their own envy. They don't want to see it anywhere else. And then the cycle keeps going. In James chapter 3, verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Envy is the mother of sibling rivalry. Sibling rivalry is real. It's because of envy. It's because of self-ambition. It's because of selfishness. But look at human history. I mean, look at the first set of children sibling kid, his own sibling hasn't stopped watching one of those uh, documentaries about a kid that killed his whole family because he wanted the inheritance that's human nature envy is the mother of sibling rivalry it's the mother of first cousin rivalry and even church member rivalry Divides churches and homes. Hold tight, I'm coming to the good news. In verse 5, Paul gives them the solution for spiritual growth. The good news is that as believers, we have the Spirit of God. He enables us to mature from these things. He enables us to focus on Him, to be content on Him, to take our eyes off ourselves, to take our eyes off others, and to keep our eyes on Him and be content in Him. That's Paul's solution to the Corinthians. Notice how he responds in 1 Corinthians 3.5. Keep in mind they slandered Him. They also flattered him. Uh, uh, they gave him flattery. They flattered him. Now when they slandered him by saying, oh, you're just a nobody, and when they judged him according to the world's standards, he doesn't respond in such a way, who do you think you're speaking to? I'm the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm smarter than all of you put together. Now that only fuels envy. Notice his response. He doesn't say, Oh, no, no, I'm smarter than any of you. He doesn't accept the flattery. Notice what he says to them. Praise God for the word of God. This is our hope. This is how we grow. This is a mirror that not only shows us our sin, but this is a mirror that gives us the spiritual solutions that is found in God and God alone. Notice how he responds to them. Who then is Paul? In other words, get your eyes off people. Get your eyes off yourself. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Rather than saying, who do you think I am? He's saying, yes, I'm a nobody. Let's keep our eyes on God. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers, that is servants, through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul is saying that he's just a servant of God. God does not need us, but chooses to use us. Paul uses an analogy from agriculture. Just as a farmer plants the seed and his colleague waters the seed, it's God that makes that plant grow. It's God that gets the glory. It's God that gets the thanks and the praise. It's the same thing with, preacher, with the preacher's work in the kingdom of God. God has given us the privilege of proclaiming the gospel and discipling believers, but it's God who gives the increase. It's God that gives spiritual life, and it's God that causes the growth. 
Notice with me, verse 7, Paul goes on to say, So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Talk about dousing envy. The servants of Christ are nothing in the sense that God does not need us, but he chooses to use us. Therefore, the servant is a recipient of the blessings of God and a channel of those blessings, but all is from God. The point of Paul is this. Glory in God, not in man. Take your eyes off yourself, take your eyes off others, and just keep them on God. I've picked on people in the congregation um, that can be carnal towards the preacher. Now let me pick on preachers for a little bit. Man-centered churches, I've seen this over and over again. Man-centered churches with narcissistic pastors fuel envy, strife, and division. Of course, they don't cause it. It's in our sinful nature. But they fuel it. They fuel it. But God-centered churches with God-glorifying pastors douse the fires of jealousy. You know how man-centered churches with narcissistic pastors fuel jealousy? Keep in mind, it's already there. It's in all humans. It's in unbelievers. And they've got a double whammy. They have no way of escape. It's in believers, but we have the Spirit of God, and that really good news is coming in a moment. But since the believer has the Spirit in the flesh, he comes to church... As a refuge, not as a place where it comes and the spirit of rivalry is rampant. It's up to the preacher to douse envy in the way the way he fuels envy is when he himself loves the limelight, when he himself loves being on the pedestal, when he himself glories in people. I once went to this conference, and at this conference, just to give you an example of how some pastors and churches, man-centered churches, fuel envy. Once went to this conference, it was an annual thing, and at this conference, they would, the pastor that was leading this conference would hand out awards. Like the rookie, of the, the rookie pastor of the year award, the pastor of the year award, and so forth. And you see in churches, these same churches, they even start it young with children. And then they tell the children, you memorize this amount of verses, we're going to give you a big trophy at the end. And then annually at the church's anniversary, they bring up the children and this one was the one that memorized the most. This one was the one that sang the best. And you see the spirit of rivalry and envy and the parents are just very envious of one another. And the children are learning to jump through hoops to perform, not to glory in God. By the way, who are people? To give an award, a pastor of the year award, to another person. Do you want to know something? One of the pastors that got that pastor of the year award was found to be a pedophile five years later. What happens when you start glorying in man and bringing that competitive thing, it causes the people to want to get up on the platform, to get that limelight. The goal is no longer the glory of God. The goal is self-achievement. You 
You know where that idea comes from? I once pulled it up, I'm thinking, this doesn't sit well. I mean, what do you mean, Pastor of the Year Award? You know where they get their idea from? They get it from the Grammy Awards. Where else do they get it from? They've borrowed from the world. That's what the Corinthians were doing. They borrowed this sectarian, this, this, they wanted this smooth rhetoric because they picked it up from the local theater. It's worldliness. They brought it into the church. The Apostle Paul's saying, we don't need this. We don't need the world's ways. We have Christ and Christ crucified. And the message of the cross is sufficient to motivate people to love God. Another preacher told me that one time I seen preachers like signing Bibles and I could never get my head around it. What do you mean people are lining up to sign your Bible? And I once asked the preacher and he said to me, well, if they're not going to idolize preachers, they're going to idolize football players. Instead of him having a picture of a football player, let him have a picture of the preacher you know, and sign, with him signing the picture. Now, I see the logic behind that, but the Word of God tells me that I don't need that. I just need the preaching of the cross of Christ. Notice how Paul douses the fire of envy. doesn't fuel it with man-centeredness and relishing in flattery and the limelight and so forth. Notice how he says in verse 8, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Notice how he says, Now he who plants and waters are one. He is saying that the servants of Christ are one in rank and purpose. When the pastor thinks that he's the king of Israel, when it becomes like a royalty thing or a sort of uh, a hierarchy where it's top down, of course humans with a sinful, envious nature are going to want that limelight. That's what I like about a multiple eldership. It's not like a one-man show or a one-man royalty that only one man could fill. It's a multiple eldership. The more elders the church has, the better. So Paul is saying we are one, one in rank and purpose. Yes, we have different functional roles, but we are one in rank and purpose. They're on the same team working for God's glory. Paul gives another analogy. 1 Corinthians 3.9, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Paul is saying that God owns the workers and owns the building, and hence the glory and honor belongs to God. In conclusion, here's the good news. The cure to spiritual immaturity, specifically the immaturity of envy, is God himself. We need to get our eyes off ourselves and off others. God is the one that makes us his children. He's the one that causes us to mature. However, God ordains the ends and the means. The way he causes us to mature and grow is this. He gives us his spirit and then he instructs us to live according to the spirit. In other words, he enables us and he commands us. He gives what he demands and he demands what he gives. He showers us with his grace and then instructs us to grow in grace. In 2 Peter 3.18, the Word of God says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's instructing the people of God, you grow in grace. In his book, Holiness, that we've been going through on Wednesday nights, in chapter 6 on spiritual growth, J.C. Ryle makes the point that God ordains the ends and the means. In chapter 6, Ryle says that Christians spiritually grow as they pray privately as they read their Bible daily, as they spend time daily in private meditation and repentance. They grow when they corporately are obedient to God and obey the Lord's day and come to church on Sunday. It says Christians grow when they corporate, uh, through corporate prayer and praise, through hearing the word of God preached at church, by partaking in the Lord's table when we congregate together as the body of Christ, 
And he also points out that a Christian grows when he separates himself, herself from bad company and separates himself, herself unto God. That's how a Christian grows. A Christian's growth, like we see with the Corinthians, will be stalled, will be halted when we don't walk in the Spirit and live according to the spiritual things of God. That's what the Word of God says. In Galatians 5.16, he says, I say then, walk. Walk, in other words, live in the Spirit. Live according to the spiritual things of God. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.1, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, here it is, envy and evil speaking. So in saying there needs to be a separation from sin. You need to separate yourself from sin. And then he goes on to say there's a separation from sin and a separation unto God. That's holiness. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So to grow, we need the pure milk of the word of God. We need the nourishment of the word of God as we separate ourselves from sin. That's the means of God. I've said it about four times, but this is it. The good news is this. The good news is if you're a true believer, it's good news for the true believer, bad news for the unbeliever. The good news for the believer, that's why I reject the doctrine of the carnal Christian. You can, never, you can uh, behave carnally, but you can never be in a state of carnality. You cannot never be in a position of carnality. That's an unbeliever. It doesn't make sense to say you're in a position of or in a carnal state and be a believer. It doesn't make sense. Our position is in Christ. The good news is this. True believers eventually come good. The Corinthians that were true believers came good. That's why he wrote the letter. He was hopeful. True believers come good. The disciples of Christ were very, very immature but they came good. The person who never grows and never comes good was never saved to begin with. That's what Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 after describing the sins of the flesh or the works of the flesh, it goes on to say, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This time I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Just give you a few moments for you to respond to God. I acknowledge that I'm not perfectly mature. None of us are. We're perfectly or sinlessly perfect, perfect in heaven. But here we're all, as Christians, growing. So I encourage you to plead with God that you would be more and more like Christ. We all struggle with sins daily, but we repent daily, and therefore we grow daily. And therefore, we do mature. We do learn to love God and be content with God. We do learn to be happy for others. We do learn to love others. It happens when our eyes are on God. When we walk in the Spirit, when we say no to our flesh and yes to spiritual things. And yes to the enablement that God has given us to walk according to his word and ways. Let's give a few moments for a time of repentance. <clears throat> Heavenly Father God, we're thankful for who you are and what you do. Thankful that you died for people like us, filled with strife and envy and so thankful that 
the Almighty to save, save us from the penalty of sin and also from the dominion of sin, the control of sin. We acknowledge, Lord God, that we struggle daily, that we sin daily, but we're so thankful, Lord God, that you brought us to our knees in repentance unto salvation. It's led us to be sensitive to sin and sensitive to offending you and offending others, Lord God. Thankful for the gift of daily repentance. You smite our hearts. You don't let us go, Lord God. We do persevere because of your grace. Help us mature more and more, Lord God. I trust, I believe, I know who I am, I know how sinful I am, I know my struggles, but I also know you, Lord God. I know that you are mighty to cause that genuine, progressive change where we love you, are content in you. We love others. We sacrifice for you, for others. Pray for our church, Lord God, to help us to grow more and more, to learn to love each other more and more as we love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.